بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Welcome to another podcast with Dean Machine uh, You're here with uh, brother Khalid Assalamu alaikum And brother Absa Assalamu alaikum And myself Sam Inshallah we're all going to try to discuss about the current affairs of the Ummah And what the Ummah is facing And inshallah we want to uh, talk about you know, what the Ummah should be doing and um, what are the key factors which are actually targeting the Muslim Ummah and how it's targeting the Muslim Ummah. So inshallah, I just want to go straight into it and obviously just pick up the key factors or key points at the at the moment of what's happening around, around the world. So inshallah, if we can just start off with Palestine, any of us want to jump into it, just, uh, just, 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 just give us an overview of what's happening in Palestine at the moment. You want to take this one up, sir? Uh, I'll talk about the Uyghur, so I'll let you continue. Right, no problem, no problem. Yeah, I mean, like, uh, I think it's public knowledge now that uh, what's happening in Palestine uh, in terms of the West Bank, um, obviously we know that uh, Israel is uh, trying to annex it. And, it's, uh, and the fact of the matter is that it's going against all human rights organizations, it's going against the the so-called, you know, United Nations that doesn't really do anything for anybody, really. And, um, you know, it's, it's doing what it wants to do, uh, obviously, um, because the West are silent over this, and, you know, that's indirectly telling, the, telling Israel to continue what they're doing. So we can see that uh, oppression is taking, well, oppression has been taking place continuous in Palestine, but um, now with, without the um, defense, of a of a sort of solidified unified ummah, um, we can see that uh, the, uh, Palestine itself is just getting more and more destroyed every day, you know. So that's what's happening in Palestine at the moment. And I mean, you, you hear loads of reports coming from Palestine, you know, like um, uh, a a, um, a disabled person getting shot dead. Um, uh, regarding the, you know, when you got like George Floyd. Where he he um, he he died on, on the hands of br- police brutality. In fact, I heard the reason why I'm mentioning this is because the police officers that were trained um, and who did that to um, George Floyd, they were actually trained from the Israeli force. And you see that the Israeli force, the army, they use this tactic of bring neck on uh, sorry the, the knee on the neck. Um, all over Palestine, yeah. So and then even even the Imam of um, uh, the the the, the Masjid Al Aqsa, you know, he was even arrested, you know, and there's no charges. The, the only charge that they make of fake charges. So you can see there's a lot of um, lot of um, oppression that is taking place within a Pal- within Palestine. Yeah, definitely. I mean, like, uh, I mean, the land itself. I mean, uh, is purely for the Palestinians. Obviously, as a Muslim, we don't we differentiate ourselves as you know what our nationality is, but it's it's, it's differentiated as, as a Muslim entity. Um, the fact that this land was owned by Muslims uh, at one point, and now it's it's been an occupied land by the Jews, and they have literally, you know by themselves willing willing themselves just come into a land and it's taken over and it's just done whatever they like and um it's come to a point where this 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 land this is this is not just any ordinary land this is the holy land this is where the much of much of al-aqsa is the first the first kaaba sharif for the for the Ummah and this land has now been taken over by the Jews and they can literally do whatever they want and and they are literally doing right now whatever they they want to do they're taking over lands they'll treat the people of palestine how they want to treat them and again this is the key word where you're trying to use oppression this is oppression upon the ummah and uh, obviously it's not just you know this area itself it's many many different areas so obviously without 
Absa, Absa was talking about the Uyghur Muslims, um, how they how they're being treated, um, how the Chinese people uh, are treating these type of Muslims, and just bear in mind these countries are you know filled with Muslims, and the surrounding countries around it, you know our our Ummah, we are sat down uh, quite silent towards these issues. Um, silent meaning as in that we're not taking action in terms of. Um, doing something about it, but rather we are we are just speaking in terms of like oh this is bad, um, you know as much as we can do we, we're just sitting here hating within our hearts. But you know the the situation in, in to the Uyghur Muslims, it's one of like it's the far it's 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 horrific to to, to myself in the fact there's certain reports of um what was it now uh, they're, they're cutting out parts of uh, yeah. internal organs of the human Muslim harvesting. and they're just they're selling you after people human harvesting yeah that's what it's called and um, it's, it's just it's just bizarre what they're doing I mean uh, uh, I'm, sorry, I'm sorry you wanna if you wanna go into more detail with you I know you wanted to speak about this a bit earlier yeah so um, the reality is that the Uyghur Muslims are part of the Ummah whether if you're a Uyghur Muslim or if you're from Palestine or Kashmir or Britain, anywhere around the world, you are part of that ummah. And the only crime for these Muslims uh, is because they are what? What exactly is happening with them? The only crime is because they are Muslims, right? So there's no other way of looking at it, and that's the reality of it. Um, for decades, they've been going through this, and they're being oppressed in a socio-economically in their very own land. I mean, the only those who are politically blind and selfish will fail to see that oppression and the Chinese regime justified their atrocities by associating any form of resistance against their authority with the allegation that these are terrorism so they're saying these are the terrorists and we need to put them in a concentration camp so we can bring them back to well bring them back to how they want it how they want to see the people <coughs> in that sense so even if some of these Uyghur Muslims did take arms and they did, they did the, they wanted to, you know, they wanted to battle this oppression. Um, they couldn't really do it without the help of the whole of the Ummah. Um, so, what should we do? We should also we should be reminded of what's happening around the world, and we should be helping one another. We should be helping our brothers and sisters around the world. I mean, yeah. Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, a Muslim is. A, Brother is a brother to another Muslim. He does not wrong him and does not desert him. And this is in Bukhari. Yeah, I mean, like, it, it just depends on what kind of help you're talking about. Because there's so many, the, you know, in the Ummah itself, there's so much love for other brothers and sisters. And obviously, they're not from the, from the uh, same blood family, but they're in the family of Ummah. Our ummah. So there's a lot of love, but the thing is, is how they channel that love for the Ummah in terms of actions and what actions they undertake in order to solve the issue. Because so many times there's been cases where, you know, the people will go to the other extreme, to the other extreme. And what I mean by this is by, for example, like oh, brothers will go out there to you know, do the charity, or one of the charity stuff and uh, fundraise and whatnot. But then again, there's another bomb takes place, takes place, another one takes place, another gun shot takes place, another killing takes place, to a point here that even these people that went over there to help out, they see that this is only futile, doesn't make any difference, you know. And and then they find out that uh, those same brothers who went there to initially do charity charity work and everything, end up, you know end up uh, going to uh, joining armies, resistant parties, political parties. And even then, then they're considered as a terrorist. So the thing is, is there's, there's ways of, um, uh, you know, solving this, uh, the issue. But following, the, following your whims and desires is not the way. Just uh, because at the end of the day, you know, as Muslims, Allah SWT has warned us that we should not follow our whims and desires. So when it comes to uh, uh, our our salah, our fasting, our our recitation of Quran, um, and so many other obligations that we have to do as Muslims, 
you know, we always have to look to the examples of our Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, not the examples of, uh, of other people, only the example of our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That's the main thing. I, I, I really think that that's what we need to be doing. 100%. Uh, definitely that the fact that that's literally hitting the uh, nail to the coffin. Um, that we as Muslims, we should be constantly be reminded, um, you know, from ourselves, you know, from other brothers, the, the root of Islam, um, how the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Sahabas carried yeah. their life and how they lived their life because they were not, you know, a people where they just come, you know, and they, they literally everything went smooth sailing for them, that it was literally a red carpet and just walked on it and the people of the world became Muslims. No, they went through also oppression as well. Yeah. And uh, a lot of the, if, subhanAllah, if you just compare, it, it's, it's not exactly the same, but if you compare to our lives, uh, what's happening, um, Alhamdulillah, we are, we're blessed that we're, we're here right now and that we're not being uh, physically abused or oppressed by, you know, these enemies, but the people within these countries, such as Yemen, such as um, Palestine, such as the, the Uyghur Muslims, yeah. Kashmir, Dan, Syria, and the list can go on. These people are physically being abused. These are, these are the same types of, you know, Sahabas who were also physically abused at the time of the Prophet so long. You know, the time where, so you know, um, they were, you know, they, they asked the Prophet so oh, Prophet so long, please pray for us for protection uh, when they were being oppressed. And, you know, the Prophet so replied back to them, you know, um, you are too much of a hurry. At the time of Isa Salam, yeah. you know they were, you know, uh, their skin was ripped off the uh, off the bone f- f- with metal mm. cones. You know, these oppression has come from prophet to prophet to prophethood. Obviously, we're not we're not saying we're prophets, but we're saying that we've done the lineage of the, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and it's 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 comes to a point where that why is the fact that we as Muslims like Absa, uh, Absa uh, had said earlier, why is it that the, the the key figure is oppression is a Muslim? Why is the problem a Muslim? Yeah, that's yeah. what we need to understand and discuss in terms of why is it that all these countries are being oppressed are all Muslim countries? Why is it that these um, the militaries, the agents, the, the the West, the Americans, you know, the, mm. the armies, everything? are in the lands of uh, Muslim countries. You need to ask these questions. Why is it like this for? Mm. Is it because, you know, they have they are oil rich? Is it because they have very, um, you know, the high mineral mineral and natural resources? Um, would you guys say that's the reason why uh, America and all these other countries have invaded into Muslim lands? Is to take the the, the fruits, the, the natural fruits of the land? Is that is that why why they're there? What do you think? Oh, yeah. I mean, um, if you look at why the countries of the Muslim countries, well, uh, why they're not intervening, why they're not helping the people in Palestine, why they're not helping the people in Uyghur or or any parts of the world, they're only interested in dealing with arms and trades. They're only interested in doing training and business. So they, as much as they want to probably help the people of the Ummah around the world, they they're more interested in dealing with um, their business aspects they want to see what's in it for them first yeah. so in that sense there is quite difficult for them to get involved because if they do say if they do speak about china or what's happening around with the uyghur muslims or if they do speak about yeah. what's happening in palestine kashmir then yeah. then there'll be sanctions against them there'll yeah. be um they'll be blocked in the sense of yeah. having these trade deals so that's why it's yeah well i mean like sorry gone yeah i was gonna say just to clarify the question again i was going more to the fact that you know these countries who which are invaded, the muslim country which is invaded let's let's go for a key example is afghanistan or in iraq why is it that the most the american armies had invaded was it for oils and riches and and you know for for the for the natural um products of the land what what was it the what what was it was that was that the only reason why they invaded uh, the muslim land that was the question i asked 
Oh, that's uh, yeah. Sorry, I misunderstood that. So definitely, there it wasn't just for spreading that; it was to spread the message of Islam. That was basically it. And let's all face it: Islam is the whole entity that looks after the whole of the mankind, and it's a way of life. It's, um, it's a guidance for mankind. Yeah, I mean, and, I think, yeah. Sorry, I think you're right. Yeah, I mean, like, sorry to interrupt. Yeah, yeah, you're right in terms of that. Like, uh, they saw the threat of Islam. Um, uh, that was the issue. They saw that uh, America. They saw the threat of Islam as a, as a, as a competitor, as another competing ideology, another competing system, a way of life, like you said before. Um, yeah, See, I, mean, I like yeah. I like I like I like the term you just used there, yeah. uh, ideology, a threat, uh, a competitor. So you know this term, uh, Brother Khalid just used ideology. Okay, let's let's go into uh, into that, yeah, because you just uh, yeah. you know jumped into a little a topic area. What do you mean by an ideology, and uh, how does this even involve into the oppression of the Muslims? Well, really it boils down to the Shahada, isn't it? So a lot of people they might think that Shahada is just a it's just it's just a sentence that you say if you become a Muslim, and it's just a sentence that you believe in. And that's it. But really and truly, we have to look at, you have to understand it's all about perspective, right? And having the correct perspective can go, the long, uh, go a long way. Having the incorrect, incorrect perspective can go the wrong way, you see? And what I mean by this is when you, uh, when you declare something, anything in life, you declare something, yeah, and you have witnesses, when you make that declaration, yeah, this is a promise that, is that, that either needs to be fulfilled or is already been fulfilled. It's a declaration. The Shahada is a, is, a, is, a, is a declaration that you are a slave of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and whatever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to do, you do. And that entails so many, uh, so many uh, ways um, of life in terms of socials ways, uh, social way of life, financial way of life, um, in terms of uh, family way of life. Have you not noticed I'm using a key word here, way of life, why? Because the way of life is an ideology. It's the ideology is, is, is mm. by living in a certain way of life. Now, when it, comes, mm. when it comes down to other ideologies, just like capitalism and communism, um, capitalism, they have identified a competing ideology, a competing way of life here, that will compete with them, which is Islam. Because why? Because Islam gives you solutions, just like capitalism does. But it's the matter of the the greatness of the solution. How great is that solution? You know what I mean. So what I mean by this is like um, you know that saying. Uh, what's that called now? It's, uh, I'm comparing it to the saying where if you if you teach, what's that saying regarding if you teach a human being how to if you know, if you if you if you if you feed a human being, a person, um, uh, um, by you fishing yourself and giving them the fish, then that'd be that be okay for the day. But if you teach them how to fish, then that'd be set for life. The meaning behind that is is the fact that the, the both solutions, which one's the best solution? And in this regard, Islam is the best solution. Islam has the best economic policies. Islam has the best uh, social policies. Islam has the best um, family policies. It's not the best everything policy. Now, this is why the capitalists and their likes and their countries that, that champion this ideology, and he was an extension of this ideology, they don't want that. Why? It's because they don't want their, their capitalistic ideology to not exist anymore. You see, this has always been the, the theme throughout our, all our podcasts that we always say is the fact that Capitalism is an ideology, it is only any ideology, but there is another ideology out there, which is Islam, and Islam is competing with it. Hence why you see a lot of Muslim countries who are not implementing full 100% Islam, and they are more or less um, uh, you know, thinking, about the, thinking about their own uh, country's interests, which has to be, again, this is against Islam. But why is it that so many American, uh, so many Western powers always intervene in Islamic affairs, Islamic countries affairs, sorry. Why? Because they know that if they don't intervene, then what will happen, a revival, a revival will occur. 
and obviously they don't want that. So this is what it is. And I mean, if, if, um, even if you look back in history with it, regarding the Cold War, see, in the, even in the Cold War, the reason why the uh, the America won the Cold War is because the ideology which they were propagating, which is capitalism, was a better ideology, a better way of life. So the so uh, the Soviet Union they start dividing. Why? Because they 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 themselves realize that the fact that communism wouldn't cut it. Communism is not a better lifestyle. It's actually a more poorer lifestyle than a than a capitalistic lifestyle. So you get what happened? You have separation within their ranks, within their within their states, and you have like now you got Russia. It's not even Soviet Union anymore. See what I mean? Because why? Because again, capitalism was a better ideology, and now what's happening is. Islam is an ideology that they already know is a is a competitor, and now what's happening is they want to intervene all the time. So they use such puppets like MBZ and Mohammed bin Zaid or MBS, Mohammed bin Salman, which Mohammed bin Salman even said to himself that um, he wants the Middle East to be the new Europe. Europe is based upon kufr. Europe is based upon secularism. It's not based upon Islamic foundations uh, whatsoever. Only you can say, like, for example, Spain or one, but even then they lost that. They lost that cultural, Islamic cultural aspect of it. And now it is based upon Kufr. So when he says about Europe, why do not say about based upon a golden era, the golden Islamic era? Or why not based upon when the, there was no poverty within the Islamic state back in the day when, when the lead, under the leadership of um, uh, Omar ibn Abdul Aziz? Why not talk about that? Or why not talk about the, 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 the richest man in the world? Uh, Mansa Musa, he was a Muslim, you know, and every time he'd go to make pilgrimage, yeah, and he'll go through the uh, countries, you know, that country, uh, that country or that state, the economy, the, the economy will, uh, will be much better than it was before, just because he visited, because that's how rich he was. So there's so many aspects in Islam that, uh, you know, we can talk about and we can say, but all in all, is the fact that Islam is a competitor, because why? Because it's a better ide ideology. Or else, if it wasn't a better ideology, I don't think the capitalists would even care because I don't think people would care about living by an Islamic way of life. But people do, yeah, Muslims I really, do. I really enjoyed the fact that you used the, these examples of the history of, of, of the Muslim Ummah uh, in terms of how they flourished and how, um, how successful they, they were. They once were, the Ummah was uh, at a very high position at one point. And um, uh, it's the fact that you know you said that bin Salman they want he wants to he wants to be the new Europe but subhanallah you have all these examples you just given and they want to become you know something like that so I find that really crazy and it's just going back to the point of fact that if you truly believe that the ummah is truly affected or attacked by um the means of okay they want to take our lands because they see that it's oil rich that it's got natural minerals it's got this and that if you believe that that's the real issue why the west is constantly attacking the muslim lands then you're truly blinded to the real issue um like a brother khalid had had, had mentioned that it's an attack it's, it's a battle of hearts and minds it's a battle of which one is the stronger ideology and obviously at the moment, capitalism is at the forefront because it has influenced many, many Muslim countries. It has influenced it not just by, you know, the people adopting their way of life, but it's adopted the leaders. Sorry, yeah. it's not adopt, uh, um, issued a problem to find the leaders. It's, a, it's, it's, it's very much, it's people as well, many countries. And uh, let's, let's look at, at, a, at a deeper, not a deeper level, but on a, on a, on a level where it's closer to us if we look at it as, as like this, as as a Muslim, as as a person, do we can we practice the um, the free, the four freedoms uh, that capitalism um, portrays? For example, the freedom of belief. Can a Muslim can uh, you know one day re uh, choose to become a Muslim and the next day become a apostate? Yeah, can well, can a Muslim do that? Yes or no? No way. No. They can't do that. And then the second freedom, the freedom of ownership. Can a Muslim, um, you know, hoard and take everything for themselves? Or is it their right and obligation to to share or to give to other people? They can't be sit here and, mm. like, take everything away and keep to themselves. They can't do that. Um, and, you know, uh, the, the, the other one is the freedom 
uh, the personal freedom. You know, this country, the UK, they um, encourage um, was it safe sex and stuff like that. Um, as a Muslim, what what are we encouraged to do to be married and then you know we can go into that into that area. But again, these these are these are these freedoms in terms of they portray and. Um, uh, what's it called? Advertised a lot in the in the in the capitalist system, and these these even these little freedoms, we, it is it has literally infiltrated a lot of the ummah in terms mm. of oh we do have freedom of speech. Uh, mm. Muslim Muslims do have freedom of speech. I mean, how how can you say that we do have freedom of speech? That would mean that the freedom of speech would mean that uh, the Islam uh, the Islam's uh, barrier of insulting the Prophet would be lifted if we have freedom of speech. Do you get that? Yeah. Does that make sense to you guys? Definitely. I mean, like, uh, when you talk about freedom of speech, I mean, like, can you go up to a police officer and start swearing at them? Can you do that? No, well, you in can't. The, in, in this country, yeah. Yeah, in this country. Do you, you okay? do that? Are you allowed to say and do whatever you want in front of the police officer? Basically, um, yeah. say a big stuff to them. Is no, that freedom of speech? You can't, you can't, you can't because exactly. they got hate speech. So, so how can the capitalism promote freedom of speech when mm. you can say whatever you want and not get away with it and this so is again, again that's a, that's a brilliant point again why islam itself is the greater ideology and why it's such a threat because it caters to the instincts of man and the the you know what man yearns for it, it, it caters for that it's because it's a system which is made by made by allah subhanahu wa ta'ala it's not a system made by man. It's a system by created by the creator. Hence, it's always going to be um, something which is a threat to the opposition system. Yeah, I mean, Islam is, uh, yeah, so Islam is, yeah, right, absolutely. Um, that is command and prohibitions that we follow from Allah. And it's, um, Allah's given this to all of us to follow. And this is a manual, it's a, it's a guidance for the mankind. I mean, if you look at capitalism, what does it do? It's um, it's promoting the looks of the overall wealth produced and fails to see if everyone has been fed of hunger and is still rising while food is being wasted. You know, food is still being wasted out there. Yeah. Bit. And capitalism also promotes uh, the privatization of the natural resources. And mm. then they encourage people to uh, monopolize um, these are the things um, that capitalism promotes and these are the things that um, Islam prohibits. I mean, like, Islam is all about having an equal share, equal opportunities, equal rights. Okay, so you know how you, we've all just discussed um, the cons and pros of Islam against, uh, against capitalism? Even there's so many cons stacked against capitalism. Why is it that this system is still, sorry, the system when, and the people are still duping or convincing the ummah to accept their their system of life? So can you repeat the question again? Sorry. So okay, so you know how we discussed the pros and cons of you know capitalism against Islam. Yeah. Uh, and we stacked all the cons now we just said that th this and this and this yeah. uh, is from capitalism for example you know how you said about you know food is wasted and there's still so many people hungry mm. um, you know that's it's, it's just one example but I'm just saying that these are the, the cons of capitalism why is it that still this system capitalism is still being you no know, followed by the people of of other Muslim lands and accepted by other Muslim lands also. Why is it still weird that we are falling into the trap of accepting it? Yeah, because first again, okay, let's look at let's look at the champion of this ideology, which is America. Um, even in America themselves, right? They are especially with this coronavirus pandemic that's taking that's taking place and the mishandling of obviously Mr. Trump. And uh, and obviously the Black Lives Matter the, the things uh, taking place as well. Um, that the fact that they see that the flaws of the ideology. And I, I'm, I'm going to answer your question. This is related. To, this answer is related to your question. Um, is the fact that they see the flaws of the ideology. That the, it, this is a systematic issue that racism is actually embedded in the heart of America. Even if you look at how America was, even America, you know. Um, it was actually uh, by oppressing 
um, other races, right? In order to get what they want, yeah? And this was a form of racism. They killed so many Native Americans, right? And, um, and this was a form of racism. So anyway, even in the beginning of how America was formed, it was it was formed by oppression, oppressing oppressing who oppressing the other race. Anyway, going back to your question as well, is even Americans themselves they said they have no other alternative. You see placards when they're protesting in Black Lives Matter protest, in even in the recession that took place um, years ago. You know, you see that people are saying, look, there's no alternative. We need another alternative ideology, another alternative system, because even even the, uh, even the Americans themselves have said that this is a systematic issue. Anyways, that's America. This is the heart of, um, of the ideology, the championing of the ideology. Now, if you look at Islam itself, you need to understand is that the Ummah itself are not, um, they have been in, They've been infected by so many different types of poisons throughout the years, whether it be freedom, which is a poison, whether, whether it be democracy, which is a poison, whether it be asabia, which is asabia means tribalism, is poison, whether it be sectarianism, which is another poison. And over the years, it wasn't like, oh, yesterday the Ummah was divided and now the Ummah is weak and now we're getting oppressed. It was like, it took years of uh, years and years of planning and plotting and implementation of the enemies of Islam to get to where they are right now. It took years. And even if you look back in history, you look back in history with regards to um, you know the sykes picot Agreement, you find out that the French and the British, about uh, nearly 100 years ago, they were they were they're already uh, lining the Middle East here yeah, and putting a ruler down and said, here you go, that's um, Egypt, here you go, that's uh, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, Palestine, here you go, or that's uh, uh, Yemen, you know, that's Bahrain. So they were already, see, and they never visited the Middle East, but yet they are plotting and planning already. So they were, and what did they do? They, they gave those such poisons to the fact that even, so for example, one of the poison, if you, let's go through all the poisons. The first poison is basically asabia. The, the, you, you want to be proud and uh, prideful of where you are born. So then you'll have the, um, you know, the, the, the Egyptians, they're like, oh, we are the Egyptians. We're born in Egypt, we are Egyptian. We have pyramids, we have history, we are proud of um, we are part of where we're from you see this at first you think oh this is nothing this is you know it's not going to hurt anybody you know you know they're happy where they're from or not but this then turns into something which is very destructive destructive and division of the ummah right rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam said that um they you know tribalism you know whoever supports or dies or fights for tribalism is not one of us or well, tribalism in today's day and age is nationalism. Being nationalistic and being proud of where you're from, and replacing that bond of of the of, of the Islamic bond that you have with your brother, your, with your brothers and sisters, and replacing with the nationalistic bond and only caring about your brothers and sisters up until the border of your country, um, then that that becomes detrimental. So you only care about oh, Kashmir is a Kashmir issue. Palestine is the Palestine issue. Yemen is a Yemen issue. Um, well, Sudan is a Sudan issue. Somalia is a Somali issue. Somalian issue. See what I mean? So again, you can see that even you know this is already within the Ummah. Then you have freedoms. Now, with freedoms, uh, you have uh, this is waging war against Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, because at the end of the day, we are Abdullah. We are we always we are the slave of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. We made the declaration that we will abide by Allah Subhanahu wa Taala whatever He tells us to do. We hear and we obey. Yeah, when we break the rules, we have consequences. We have uh, we have sin or we have reward. Sin when you break the rules, you are then assigned a sin. Uh, inshallah, we don't. But this is how it goes. Then what happens? Obviously, there's a consequence, isn't it? Inshallah, we don't go to Jahannam for that one sin or that two sin, or the third sin. 
But then you have the things like, for example, when you do something which is an obligatory action upon you, you don't make the rules, you don't break the rules, you follow what Allah Subhanahu tells you to do, and you get rewarded for it. Inshallah, we go to Allah for those. Inshallah, I mean. But the, but the thing is, right? Uh, we are we are freedom is not in Islam. Yes, Allah Subhanahu has given us free will to the fact that when we do get judged upon, judged upon in in Akhirah, you know, we don't have no excuse. We don't have no excuse. We can't say, oh, why are you going? Why are you putting me to Jahannam? You can't say that excuse because you had free will. You did it yourself. And Allah Subhanahu says in the Quran, I've created insan and jinn to worship me, and me alone. That's it. There's nothing else. And Allah Subhanahu says in Surah Maida, Allah Subhanahu says in the Quran that this deen is perfect. I made a favor upon you, and this deen is, is, is perfect. So there's no changing. So, anyways, this is what was taking place with the Ummah. Freedom was taking care of the uh, the freedom of uh, the poison, which called freedom, the poison of Asabiya, racism. This is all poisons that was which was in, getting infected with the Ummah even more and more and more to a point where it affected the politicians. What I mean by politicians, the 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 trusted guards, you know, the you know the guard, uh, guardianship of the Khalifa, yeah, like the Walis, yeah. It, it affected them to a point even the scholars were infected by the so the scholars would be even racist even when they would do that fatwas they become not just not just this they'll be sectarian sectarian so what they'll do is they'll say okay you know you're from this month i'm from this month don't go to this machine go to this machine this then went to inter went from a localized level to an internationalized level when this comes to an internationalized level within the ummah there's then there's so much disparate disparity and then you had the likes of agents within the ummah, the the the, the you think like, agents with the ummah where they were partner partner with the enemies of Islam and form another country, form another country so that so that they can cause rifts rifts between the ummah. Like for example, Saudi Arabia was formed, yeah, was formed on a, on the basis of the partnership of the enemies of Islam with um, uh, uh, Ibn Saud. Yeah, whilst he married the daughter of um, um, uh, what was it? Muhammad ibn uh, Abdul Wahab, sorry, ibn Abdul Wahab. You see what I mean? So that's that's one thing. You see what I mean? So there's so many other things. I think uh, uh, sometimes you know I, I just carry on for ages. Uh, what, what do you guys think? Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, like, uh, I mean, there are still there are. The, those key parts, like you said, they're the poison which has affected the Ummah in terms of, uh, you know, the sectarian divide and obviously Asabiya definitely is uh, one of them. And you, you said it uh, previously, the fact that they've been plotting and planning for a long, a very long time. And you just got to see and you understand it. Like, you know, to, 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 it's like, it's like, um, it's like something, you know, you're like revising for a test or something like that. Mm. And you know you, the test is hard at one point, and then you're revising it and you're revising it, and you see like you know what this makes sense now, and this makes sense now, and this is what's gonna happen now. Like you, you know these countries, the most the the the, the disabilities which have invaded. Um, for example, uh, look at certain countries where they've implemented leaders who are now wanting to implement democracy, mm. right? So Muslim country who are wanting to implement democracy. So what is democracy? Yeah, democracy is uh, power to man, and mm. uh, to to man, and for all, for 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 man, uh, it's it's a word uh, derived from a Greek word democratis, which is power to man. Basically, it's a it's a it's a it's a it's a, it's a term to give power to man. Basically, and this is basically removing the guard of the fact that the the laws are given from Sharia, from Sharia, which is from Sharia, which is from Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, and replacing it to, to, from to laws which is given to man, which which suits man, which suits man's needs or that country's needs, um, mm. just just you know just for whatever they for whatever purpose they want to do, do it for. Again, these are like little little snippets of um, how they're slowly infiltrating the Muslim lands. Um, other ways are uh, ridiculing Islam. So look yeah. at the Islamic State. Mm. Islamic State itself is, is such a beautiful term, beautiful thing, but because of now what ISIS, the Taliban, uh, Al Qaeda, all of this, like it's become something feared 
upon the muscles yeah. of the mouth. Yeah. We can't say without feeling some sort of you know doubt or oh my god something's gonna happen to me if I say Islamic State, you know? Because yeah. they've ridiculed it so much that they may look something dirty and um uh, something so dangerous it's become like we shouldn't say it. even you'll hear some brothers or some brothers will be like oh use hikmah don't use certain like that word or that, that term mm-hmm. around other people like how can you be feared for that term yeah. this is a term which united us all together and there's like terms where so that they would control like you know a lot of brothers will say they control the media in terms of controlling the media it's done by a certain aspect um, the focal points of certain things will be uh, moved to a different area or moved to a different area. They'll make you forget what's actually happening in that country. Mm. So the so what they do? They bombard it they'll, by military action. They'll uh, attack it. Um, they'll literally return to rubble to a point where the only option for that country would be to accept what a capitalist system. The the the, the only the only um, support they'll be getting yeah. is, will be from a western area um, another option another another thing is when when it becomes an international issue when one country is is affected by a certain you know terrorist groups or you know extremist groups sorry i should say um the, the law the un or the international law has to get involved and when they're involved what happens then uh, we have start having you know peace talks peace talk le- leads into um certain agreements, certain agreements turn into certain objectives for that country, certain objectives turn into what? Accepting certain parts of their system, which is, you know, dem- democracy. And, you know, these these small little aspects, right, it's happening all around us. And it's not it's not just a coincidence that a majority of Muslim lands have started becoming, um, let's say, modernised, uh, how they would call it by you know the muslim country there's a muslim not the muslim but certain people within those countries are now what wearing tight fitted clothes the the you know openly you know doing whatever they like they're, they're able to um, do certain things that you wouldn't expect it to happen so for example saudi have now started you know um what is it what, what's the word um you know how they that they they had wwe what's yeah. that word to use man you know the, not, not not promoted yeah. but held WWE like the, the Wrestlemania it's like mm-hmm. events you're holding events like that Nicki Minaj coming coming to sing and Chris Brown coming to sing and stuff mm-hmm. like that I mean this is Saudi this is Saudi this is Saudi Arabia where Makkah Medina are you know these are countries where mm-hmm. these are these are the countries which um, are now promoting these things and like it's 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 not a coincidence that it's this specific country which is promoting it because why we as Muslims see that area as what the Holy Land, and if the Holy Land is doing it, why can't other countries do it? Do you get what yeah, I'm trying to say? Yeah. These little things are like little drips mm. of um, uh, of little uh, ty- t- types of just moving the Muslim Ummah away from Islam as much as they can, so they go towards something which is mm. uh, left Islam and more to their system. Mm. So this is this term is called secularism. Secularism removing the 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 core belief away from worldly worldly affairs yeah mm. so they've removed islam and now they've engaged into world affairs to something which benefits what mm. i think they think that's right what the mm. people think it's right not what islam says it's right it's what they feel like it's right so you know these terms you use these poisonous ideas you use and these you know these terms you know about ideology and how they've been plotting and planning these are these are the little little aspects they've been you know plotting and planning upon the ummah for a very long time it's not just happened overnight it's been happening for yeah. you know months years 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 well before we we were even born these these plots sometimes were in place yeah i mean uh, these are excellent points you make and um yeah you can see it's happening around the world and uh, prophet sallallahu mentioned as a stranger and will return being a stranger as a big man. So give glad tidings to the stranger. Islam has become strange. Um, there's corruption, chaos everywhere. And the mm-hmm. Sunnah of Prophet Muhammad Sallam and Islam has been limited Sallam and the mosques. I mean, is this all we're meant to do? Just pray and uh, try to perfect ourselves. There's more to it than that surely mm. uh, in, yeah. in fact in many cases even if 
if you look at the pulpits of our very mosques are even represent, misrepresenting Islam. Um, and I like the point that you're making about the colonial powers um, together with the corrupt Muslim rulers have uh, waged a war against Islam. Um, since, since the last few decades, the last, uh, the links you can see um, that they're trying to reduce every Muslim to follow the capitalist way of life, basically. Mm. And this is uh, the sad case of reality, but there is, um, there is something we can do. The feeling of Islam is um, being attacked once again and causes the Muslims to unite. And, you know, we have to have this motion within us where Muslims are now, try we have to try to revive Islam. I mean, we have to go back to cleaning the dust and, um, you know, the tree of Islam has to be given the greenery again. So what should we do? We should actually yeah. work together and uh, I mean, unite ourselves. Yeah, that's true. No, we do need to unite. But then um, y y one thing is for sure that uh, we need to identify uh, where, the, where the attacks are coming from on attacking Islam, you see? So once you identify where the attacks are coming from, when the enemies of Islam are attacking Islam, then we can identify of how to um, uh, how to implement the solution, right? So the thing is, like uh, even you, uh, some you mentioned in regards to they're trying to tarnish the name of Islam, and you can't use certain terminologies now, which is uh, before it used to be a beautiful terminology, but now you can't use it without hesitation, uh, due to the social uh, pressures that we have right now. Uh, the thing is, even if you look at, uh, if you look for Egypt, Egypt for example, Egypt, they had uh, the, the they had an Islamist party called the Muslim Brotherhood. They had a leader of the party called Mohammed Morsi, and now he's passed away. May Allah forgive his sins. But the thing is, look, he was an Islamist, and to the whole world, they thought, that, okay, now an Islamist is in power. Uh, he's a ruler of Egypt. Now let's see Islam, Islam in action in public affairs. Obviously, we know that that didn't last two minutes. You know, he uh, he got kicked out of that position, um, and he was that 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 position was replaced with Al Sisi, which we which was a detriment. But anyways, going back to uh, Mohammed Morsi, he was representing Islam to the whole world. He was talking about stuff like implementing Sharia. He's talking about uh, implementing the whole of Islam. But yet, look what happened. And he came from a, he came from a party, which was Muslim Brotherhood. Um, and everybody, everybody thinks that obviously Muslim Brotherhood is a Islamic orientated group. So now that that failed, it looked like that Islam failed in the public, F, uh, public arena. You see what I mean? Even if you look at in Tunisia, and the, uh, uh, you know, the Al Nahda party. This is also another form, just like the Muslim Brotherhood, based upon Islam. Uh, they thought that they think that it's based upon Islam, that they're following the correct methodology, the correct manhaj. And now, even Al Ghanoucci, he he uh, he became the, the the leader of Tunisia, and that was even short-lived. So this was a form of politics in order to um tarnish the name of Islam in terms of the public affairs and and putting Islam to a side just like Christianity and Judaism are in terms of uh, as secular religions Islam is not a secular religion uh, Islam is not a secular religion but yet it is again put aside because a lot of people they can say oh it's, it didn't work in Egypt it didn't work in Tunisia and it's not I mean, it's surely not working in in uh, in, uh, in Iraq and Syria, or in Iraq, sorry, you know, with the likes of ISIS. So you can see that, you know, this is a, a this is a style of of embarrassing and tarnishing the name of Islam in terms of the public arena, and that Islam does hold Islam does not hold any water whatsoever. So I just wanted to point that out. And in terms of um, the um, the unification of the Ummah, this will only come. This will only come if you follow the sunnah of our, our, our beloved Prophet If you do not follow that sunnah, then you will not get the result.
this is this is it because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran that Rasulullah he says Muhammad sallallahu alaihi is an example so we all should follow us al hasana we should all follow so everything that we do we should all refer back to the Quran and Sunnah yeah even for example Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the, uh, Allah says in the Quran that follow 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 me which is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala follow uh, the the messenger and follow those in authority amongst you. Those in authority amongst you are the ones that will follow the Quran and Sunnah. So again, the the authorities that that are now in now placed in the Muslim lands, really, the Ummah should be questioning them, highlighting them. You see, see, I know a lot of um, this thing, this is trend going on for years now, and and I've noticed this as well myself that. Uh, you know when um, you highlight matters of the rulers and what they did wrong, what they did wrong, you know they they start to name tag you, and then they start to they they are very loyal to their their country. Example is Saudi Arabia. There's a, there's a lot of loyalists to Saudi Arabia, but um, in terms of if Saudi Arabia got uh, you know like you said events of Nicki Minaj or or W or whatever they're having. It's fine. Still, they'll 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 support Saudi Arabia and they'll be like, you know, Saudi Arabia is the way and whatever. And if you say anything, then you are they'll take tag you as a name like a Khawarij. You know, they'll say these things. But the thing is, haram is haram and is halal is halal. If something which is if a ruler does something haram publicly, and he's out in out in public, say for example, and I, this is a very good example that I use a lot. Say for example, a ruler. And he turns out to be gay. He's a ruler of a Muslim populated country. Turns out to be gay. And he, he implements uh, his, he, his gay, uh, gay rules and regulations. Right? And he goes, okay, this is it. He's gay. He's performing acts of gay in public, a public arena. You're telling me that Muslims shouldn't say anything about that? No, it is a, a fraud for Muslims to highlight this. But that is a haram thing. Gay is haram, of course. Now, when it comes, so what's that different towards dividing the ummah, causing sectarian strife, causing nationalistic strife, causing fitna within the ummah, partner, partnering up with enemies of Islam? This is not haram. Shouldn't we highlight this haram? See what I mean? So it's all about perspective. And unfortunately, uh, the ummah itself, they loot, they, uh, they're not politically astute. This is this is the problem. We need to be more politically astute in the correct manner, not in the incorrect manner. Following the Rasulullah and how he was politically astute, how he how he became the head of state in Medina, and how he maneuvered himself in order to become the head of state, in order to be in order to establish an Islamic state and implementing a implementing the the Quran onto the people. You see what I mean? So this is, we need to look back to the seerah, I think. We should look back to the sunnah of Rasulullah Sallallahu and really read and look what did he do, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and then implement it in our lifetime. And this is what's lacking, and being politically issued, to find out where are these attacks coming from, even predicting those attacks, even. Yeah, I mean, when it comes to these uh, uh, news articles, um, what's going around the world? I mean, ask yourself the question: How is this affecting the ummah, and what's the real reason of why they're doing these certain talks or agreements or attacks or whatever it is? To see what's the hidden agenda behind it. And obviously, the more you obviously delve into these areas, the more you have a basis of information, um, you'll start linking the dots, and you'll start seeing the the real plots and plans. Yeah, and it is our duty as Muslims to reveal these parts sometimes to the Ummah. Yeah, because if we are not going to do it, then who will? And if they're not going to be saved, then who's going to save them? Yeah. and it's it is it is important. Um, it might these podcasts might be just speech and talking and stuff like that, but end of the day, um, a society is built around people with the same common demand, demand same idea. It's easy to say, <laughs> yeah. same idea. Uh, with that, ha- or, you know, the the society being under the same idea and the same thought process, then the society uh, won't exist. Will cease to exist. It'll just be a society where, you know, for example, uh, brother used it before. You've taken out one coin, 
from the society and the society is dirty, taking out one coin, you cleaned it up and you put it back in the society, what happens to that coin? It gets dirty again. So if we're not all on the same wavelength on the same thought process, we you know we won't move forward. We won't be able mm. to move forward. We won't to make any changes. Mm. Yeah, just to comment on this as well, that like um, this, um, you know, this is very important to highlight that the uh, that uh, like for example, like uh, recent events um, regarding I don't know if you guys heard it, regarding Algeria. Uh, yeah. Have you heard about this regarding the remains of of the anti-colonial um, fighters? We heard yeah. about that. There's about see, imagine 150 years later, they got the remains of the anti-colonial fighters back into Algeria. Imagine from France. You see what I mean? So so much embarrassment, not embarrassment, but so much how, how can I explain? I did not I got no words to explain how this almost is so suffering so much, but yet there's a solution. And that's the problem because even like um, answering your previous questions or adding to the answer that I gave already is even institutions, they teach a certain type of Islam, but they leave out the bits that is also important in regards to resuming the Islamic way of life, protecting oneself from other erroneous, poisonous ideas, such as freedom of rights, such as human humanism. You know, a lot of people don't realize this. Humanism is also a threat. You see what I mean? Like, for example, I mean, have you not heard this slogan where they say, oh, we're all humans at the end of the day, and that's it. You know, we're all one world humans. Yes, we are one race. You can say this, you can say we're one race. But in terms of uh, piety, in terms of uh, the belief, we are different. But you, can, you cannot be the same as a, as a Munafik. You can't be the same as a Mushrik. You can't be the same as a Kafir. You can't. You're a Muslim. At the end of the day, yeah. So humanism is a tool. It's a, it's a tool that I've been hearing a lot now, to even um, even shake the bond of brotherhood within the ummah to the fact that oh, we're all humans at the end of the day. Everybody's everybody's a brother and sister. Everybody, yeah. In terms of biologically, maybe from Adam like Adam alayhi salam, but in terms of belief, you know, in terms of belief, no. Ummah, we are one ummah. That's it. Yeah, so humanism is another tool that is being used to, uh, and the scholars they use this a lot. These these scholars, these so-called pseudo scholars, they they scholars for dollars, I call them. You know, they they don't even highlight these matters. You know, it's not even on their topic. It's not even on their mind, even. Yeah, maybe it's in the mind. We don't know that Allah Allah. What I do know is the fact that actions speak louder than words, and you are judged upon your actions in Islam. If I wanted to establish salah. I can't, if I, I don't do Salah, sorry, uh, and, but I'm thinking about doing Salah, but I don't do it. Is my Salah accepted? No, because I didn't do it. We are judged by their actions. So when scholars, they have the ability, they have the knowledge, they have the ilm, yeah? They go to Medina University and come back. What happens? They don't talk about these things. Why? Because they, they're afraid for the repercussions. No, there has to be, we have to talk the haq, we have to talk the truth. Look at Rasulullah, what he been through. Well, look at the Sahabas, what they've been through, just because yes, of what? Is. Sorry, because the fear. As I was going to say, the Quranic verse, just to yeah. um, sweeten what you just said, but Allah yeah. ordered you to fear none but Him alone. Allah says, do not fear them and fear me if you are true believers. Yeah, no, exactly. That's, that's, that's there. There you go. Another solution. Where from? Quran. Not from my women's and desires, not my opinion, from Quran. Like, see, so that's the thing, isn't it? So every every solution in your life is in Quran and Sunnah. Every solution. And the Ummah itself can only be united upon Quran and Sunnah. Yeah, in terms of brotherhood, in terms of, you know, there's examples of brotherhood within the Quran, uh, Quran and Sunnah. There's examples of um, uh, state, Islamic state. There's examples of... Um, the, the Islamic Aqidah even. When Allah SWT says hold in chapter 3, verse 103, Surah Imran, Allah SWT says, hold tight to the rope of Allah SWT and do not be divided amongst each other. Rope, what, what is this rope? Rope is the Aqidah. The rope is the six articles of belief. And every Muslim, if it's a true Muslim, yeah, 
then they would believe in this rope. And uh, this, why is this, why this iman, why this belief, this to the belief? The belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the belief in all the prophets, peace upon them all, belief in the, um, the Quran, uh, Quran and the books, Sunnah, the belief on the uh, angels, the belief in the day of judgment, and the belief in fate and destiny. Qadr al Qadr. No Muslim will not reject any of these. And if they do reject any of these in any way, shape, or form, then they are rendered kafir. So Allah SWT said, unite amongst this, unite amongst this. Then you will see this, then you will see the fruits of this unification upon upon this rope. So hold tight to the rope of Allah. Don't be divided amongst each other. Don't. But yet, us Muslims, within them, we are, we are, we are institutionalized, indoctrinated, brainwashed in a certain way that we find other solutions which are, which which don't cut it. You know what I mean? We look towards um, um, help from the United Nations. We look to help from other um, uh, human, human humanitarian organizations. We look to help from other countries, non-Muslim countries, for help. But why? You know, Allah SWT says in the Quran, you know, that, uh, you know, they're only awliya to them. So they're only friends with each other, right? They're only friends with each other. So basically, Allah SWT is saying that you shouldn't look for them as friends. You should look from within. Quran and Sunnah, and then unification will come. This is the way. But well, this is, you know, this is, it takes time. But it, you know, it doesn't matter about time. Time doesn't matter to us anymore, because at the end of the day, we all want to die. And then at the day in the in the day of judgment, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala will ask us, "Did you do anything? Did you what did you do? You know, I gave you Quran and Sunnah. What did you do? You know, these questions we'll have to answer to those questions. And whoever listening to this podcast, they really need to think deep and really need to research upon these things. Look at the Sirah, look at the Quran um, ayahs, look at the Sunnah, yeah, and you'll find the answers, you know. And uh, this is another quick one, I know I'm talking a lot, is, um, yeah, I mean, like, sorry, yeah, just, I'm just talking a lot, sorry. It's, um, sometimes when I talk about these things, I get a bit more emotional and I talk a lot about these things, and I get very emotional. Well, it's one of those things where it's just like it's so it's like it hurts because a lot of scholars don't, don't talk about this you know and they get the tv time they get the platform but they never talk about it they talk about something which is something which is yes beneficial but there's other pressing matters that need to be addressed but yet they're not addressed so yeah subhanallah <laughs> sorry about that guys no. No, it's okay alhamdulillah we all get emotional and um yeah listening to you say those points and uh, making a very good point about referring to Quran and Sunnah should be one of our main highlights and one of the things that we should always refer to and if we don't do that then we'll always struggle and Islam is not about just uh, following blindly we have to get our heads in there take it out of the take it out the sand should we say <laughs> so let's take it out and then see what's happening, look at the bigger picture, mm -hmm. connecting the dots, as Brother Sam said. So, Sorry, uh, just, a, dots just, is, a, uh, very so just a quick one. Uh, our, um, regarding the uh, Awliya, the friends, as uh, in the chronic ayah that I was talking about, it's in Surah Maida, verse 51, Or you who have believed, do not take the Jews and the Christians as allies. They are in fact allies for one another. And whoever is an ally to them among you, then indeed he is one of them. Indeed, Allah guides not the wrongdoing people. SubhanAllah. See? SubhanAllah. Quran and Sunnah. That's the main thing. Quran and Sunnah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah inshallah, you know, um, we can, the listeners, take something from this. Um, you know, inshallah, you know, anything wrong we've said, anything offensive we've said, inshallah, is from ourselves. Anything good we've said is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yeah. And uh, forgive us if you have said anything offensive or rude to anybody. Um, 
But inshallah, you know, really do think about what we said. And I always say this to anyone I speak to about Islam, never take taqlid upon anyone. Um, what if they say, do research upon it, um, question them, uh, go, you know, you know, if, if you feel like they're saying something which is, isn't right, you know, go, you know, by all means question them question them because end of the day this is your deen this is this is your this is something you're going to take to your graves and it's your right as a muslim to know the truth and your right as a muslim to to you know um seek out the truth and go against falsehood and inshallah while we you know all, all of this we said will influence a lot more of you know the ummah inshallah they will bring about a change uh, one day, if it's not in our lifetimes, hopefully, inshallah, in a in a future, uh, the the next generation. But if we don't start here and now, then you know there's no chance for the next generation. Yeah, and we just do it for the sake of Allah. That's the main thing. Loyalty is to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. Exactly. So yeah. Inshallah. Yeah. I and mean, is there anything else you brothers want to add on to? We'll say no just uh, basically we just made the last point is um, our sole purpose in life is to worship Allah and um, if we understand this then it'll make it easy for everyone to yeah. understand what the purpose of our life is yeah. Inshallah. Inshallah. well I'll uh, conclude this podcast inshallah it was uh, fruitful and jazakallah khayyid brothers for attending today barakallah uh, Inshallah, um, soon for another podcast. Uh, be out the watch out. Please do like and subscribe and share. If you have any questions or anything like that, do comment at us. Check out our Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Uh, by all means, message us on there. Uh, we do have an email address as well. Everything's been added into the description. And inshallah, um, you have been with Dean Machine. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.